It is Wednesday, October 11th, and we will be picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 27, really about verse 29. But real quickly, from verses 5 to 29, we saw last week that Rebecca overheard that her husband Yitzhak Isaac was going to uh, fill himself with a delicious meal by his his um, outdoor son Esau, and then he wanted to give Esau that birthright blessing that did not belong to Esau for two reasons. One, God had said it belonged to Jacob, his younger brother, and then also number two, Esau had sold it to his brother. Not when his brother took advantage over a poor little weakling who was in his last moments of life and would have died. No, not hardly at all. Just someone who didn't care about the spiritual, only cared about the flesh, and was willing to shrug it off to get what he wanted, which was a bowl of food at the time. He might have thought in his own mind, I'll get it anyway. He might have thought, this doesn't hold up. He might have thought, dad's on my side. I'll get dad to do it. Who knows what he thought, but he didn't care about the spiritual, so he made that, that trade. So he, he should have, when his father said, I'll give you that blessing, he should have said, thanks, dad, but it belongs to Jacob. He didn't do that. Isaac knows that it's supposed to go to the younger because I'm sure Rebecca shared the words that she heard when the two were still in her womb that the elder would serve the younger. So he should have known. He should have acted on it. Rebecca should have trusted the Lord. She was fearing what would happen if, if things did not go the right way. She tried to step in and help it. Often I think we want to step in and help God. That's a dangerous place to be. It's hard to stand still when it seems so devastating and so immediate. It's got to be met, met with now. But what miracle would we have seen? What would we be reading in chapter 27 if Rebecca had at that moment pled with the Lord, step in, intervene, this, this is about to go wrong. Maybe she thought she was protecting her husband from receiving wrath from God for being so disobedient to God. Who knows? But she told her younger son, Jacob, go to the flock, bring a goat. I'll make it the way your dad likes it to taste. He won't know it's not Esau. He'll give you the blessing. The deception had to go on because Jacob was very fair that, that uh, <clears throat> Isaac would know if he felt and remember his eyes were dim, physical showing the spiritual at this moment in time. And Jacob's afraid, I'm deceiving my dad. If he catches that, then I'll get a curse put on me rather than a blessing. And Rebecca is so into, she's going to see to it what, what's right is done, that she even says, I'll take the curse on me. If there's going to be a repercussion, let it fall on me. So she took full responsibility. She encouraged him in the deception. She helped him. They took the camel's hair or goat hair, which was what they even made wigs out of at that time. They put it on Jacob. So when Isaac felt him, he felt hairy. When he listened, he said, your voice sounds like like your brother. It could be he was having twinges of concern and maybe even feeling guilty knowing I'm, I'm doing what I'm not supposed to be doing, but he was adamant to do his own will. We don't really know the whole story, but with Jacob in his brother's garments, smelled like Esau, felt like Esau, said the right words because he said he was Esau, you know, even how did you get the food so fast? Oh, God helped me. So he brings him in on that deception. We see a lot of steps downward, impersonating his brother, lying to his dad, bringing God into it. None of this is anything God could bless in that way but remember also that they are still Jacob's wanting to do what he knows God says is right Rhonda is that a question yes go ahead Wait. okay almost there we go I don't know why this question came to my mind but I'm going to ask it for sure a reason. is there any symbolism in them using a goat I don't think so. Um, some will even some versions say venison, which leads other people to think deer. But knowing what was in Israel, even to this day, deer are very rare even to this day in Israel. It's the goat, it's the wild goats uh, that Esau would have been hunting probably. Um, so I don't think so. It is when animals used as sacrifice at Yom Kippur time. 
but I don't I don't know of any more symbolism really. Um, we do see a symbolic picture coming out that I'm headed right up to, but I don't I don't think I remember including. No, I don't include. So I'm going to say I don't think so, but you can keep thinking on that. You might come up with something that might have value there. I'm not going to say it can't. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we saw the progression of evil, though. We, we uh, talked last week about how it's like Psalm 1, that they walk in the counsel of the ungodly, then they're found in standing with the ungodly, and then they're even sitting with the ungodly. We need to not open the door. We need to not start down that path, and we saw that. So as the story went on, and as Isaac is deceived first by his senses, then he's also deceived by, well, like hearing is part of his senses. Anyway, he continues on. If he were in tune with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't have been being fooled also. I mean, the whole thing just shows none of our people were acting up to par of how they should have been. But I am going to say that the two, Rebecca and Rachel, uh, sorry, Rebecca and Jacob, were wanting what the Lord had said to be. And they were working toward that. They just should have put it into the Lord's hands instead. So Jacob in verses 28 and 29 did get, I'm sorry, Isaac did give to Jacob the blessing in verses 28 and 29. Just overall, again, the dew of heaven, we saw the blessing for rain, for good crops, for there to be you know, a fertile lifestyle for them, the fatness of the earth the earthly, the material prosperity that was there. These are echoing words of the Abrahamic covenant also. We saw that people would serve him, the nations would bow, that he would be master lord even over his brothers. So everything was as it should be and what the blessing that Jacob was to get, spiritual, physical, the right order of, sorry, of rulership. Should Isaac had given that to Esau, that would have thwarted God's plan. That would have changed. It would have given control of the ungodly line over the godly line. It would have brought, a, 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 um, what's the word I want? Um, a black spot. That's not how I want to say it, but it would have brought into the, the godly <clears throat> line what was ungodly. That could not be allowed. The blessing of Abraham's covenant leading down to the seed had to be kept pure and right before God. Uh, and all these blessings that you see that Isaac gave over Jacob, there's five if you count them individually. In the millennium, we see all five of those flourishing for Israel. That blessing was to be on Israel and, uh, and her descendants for all generations that were to follow. So... It would have been more than a grievous sin. It would have brought corruption. That's the word I wanted. It would have brought corruption into the godly line. And God protected that line. He did not allow it. It does not mean that people who lived ungodly lives could never get in. We know Rahab, the harlot, got into the line. We know Ruth was a Moabitess, and she got into that line. But both of those put their faith in the God of Israel. It was not an ungodly person at that point in that line. They had come in under the, the, the shed blood of the coming sacrifice Lamb of God that they got in. So we see God would have had to step in, would have had to change it, but the thought that Isaac could be wanting to give that blessing, knowing the importance of it, knowing what it was from his father, how he could have thought that he wanted to give that to his son who had no spiritual emphasis, no spiritual heart, no care for the things of the Lord, that and doing right by the Lord, being obedient to the Lord, raising and continuing on family generation after generation. It, it's just it's amazing that he could have been so willing to give that to the wrong son. Before we delve more, delve more into that, let me remind you that beautiful picture, the hidden gospel, as we call it, in this chapter. We see Jacob being accepted by his father when he comes in the name of and wearing the garments of his older brother. And we know we're accepted by our father when we come to him 
in the garments and the name of that one who is called our elder brother. He's called that in Hebrews too because he took on flesh. He came into the flesh and it's in the, the robe of Yeshua Jesus that, that we come to the Father and we come in his name. That's why you pray in Jesus' name. Not saying if you pray in the name of the Father there's anything wrong, the two are one. But just my point, we looked at scriptures last week, Colossians 3, 17, John 16, 24, Acts 4, 12, that is in his name, and that this is how we come. And it follows afterward, too, that we see the father is pleased by the son's offering. Okay, Isaac was pleased with the meal. He thought, you know, this is what his son was offering, but Yeshua's greater offering was himself on the cross. It was through that that this garment uh, being clothed in is, is a sweet smelling fragrance to the Father because of the sacrifice of the Son. So it's speaking to us of Yeshua's righteous life that if we want to be a sweet smelling savor to our Father in heaven, we need to put on his garment. So we need to come in his name through his sacrifice. And just as he also, we become heirs to what's been promised by the Father because we become part of the family. Everything is Yeshua's. He created it all and it's all his, what he is heir to even in his humanity, but we too get to be joint heirs with him. That's amazing. Being adopted into that family and what that means that we'll have forever. That's amazing. So what a picture we see and I want you to realize that even though it may not come through the right means, it did go to the right son. Jacob does receive the blessing he's supposed to. And when he goes out, let's see if he's going out, out of the will of God, or if he's going out in the will of God. Let's see how God responds with him as we go on. But we need to come back to where we are in our story, and that is picking up, I think we'll pick up really at verse 30. We said 29, but I pretty much have said it. It's the blessing that was given. So, going on with our story right there, acting as if we don't know the rest of the story, we read that now it came about, this is verse 30 of chapter 27, now it came back as soon as Yitzhak had finished blessing Yaakov, and Yaakov had hardly gone out from the presence of his father Yitzhak, that his brother Esau came in from his hunting. Oh boy, here we go. Here comes Esau, he's gotten his... his he hunted, he found his game, he's prepared it, and notice how quick on the heels of Jacob he's coming in, okay? So, he comes in and he he'd made a delicious meal, verse 31, he brought it to his father. He's probably prouder than a peacock thinking, I've got it, I'm going to get this, and everything is great, and he comes into his father and he says, let me, I'm oh, sorry, I lost my place, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. See, that's all he's concerned about. I want that blessing. He wants it for the prosperity. He's not asking, we'll see from his attitude, he's not asking for the spiritual part. He wants the material part. So he's, he's ready. Here I am, Dad, I got your meal. Eat it, get full, get happy. Give me your blessing. And verse 32, his father Isaac said to him, <laughs> It's not what he said, Roger. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> he said to him, Who are you? And Esau replied, I'm your son, your firstborn. Notice the firstborn. I'm the one it should come to. I'm Esau. Verse 33 is very, very telling. It says, Then Yitzhak trembled violently and said, who then was he who hunted game and brought it to me? So that I ate from all of it before you came and blessed him. And then I want to put a pause right there. And we'll come back and talk about this sentence in a moment. But to finish the verse, yes, and he shall be blessed. Now, that first sentence, trembling violently, the Hebrews exceedingly are terrified with a great terror. Isaac, I think, in one moment was full of rage and full of fear as his senses were coming about him. Uh, another source says it, he trembled most excessively with a great trembling. This shook him to the core. 
this wasn't something light, this wasn't something, oh well, oops, no. He probably was filled with anger at Jacob. He probably was concerned what's going to happen for his son Esau. He might have even been feeling grief toward Rebecca. You know, his wife has been part of this deception. He's, he's going to know. And he might have had extreme resentment. My plans aren't being pulled off the way I intended. All of this, probably the whole gamut of emotions is going through him in one moment. Especially the <clears throat> anger. Because he knows something's happened and his will is not being done. But notice that second sentence and why I wanted that pause in there for a moment. When he said, yes, and he shall be blessed, the Hebrew says, yes, and he shall remain blessed. What Isaac realized is that even though he was trying to go against God's plan, God's plan was being accomplished. Jacob was to receive that birthright. Jacob was to be the one that was to be blessed. And he had actually pitted himself against Jehovah in trying to carry this out. That message had gone before the twins were even born. And remember, they're in their 70s now. So we're talking 70 years of knowing and how close he came. Faith comes after our eyes are open to the truth. He is not going to be able to take back and return that place in the Esau, he's knowing and he's seeing and he's realizing by his faith, he's going to say God's will is done. God's will will be done. God's will will continue to be done and nothing can change it. God had determined that Jacob would receive that blessing from the beginning before they were even born and now it's that. And in chapter 28, which we probably will not get to today, but, but probably next time, we will see Isaac send Jacob out with the proper blessing. Isaac comes fully around. He realizes he doesn't stay in that position where he shouldn't be, but it encourages us, and especially in a day like today when we're seeing Israel so devastated by war, God is at work. And even when we cannot see and cannot understand, God is going to write this. He's going to bring Israel through. We're going to see that even those who want to curse Israel will turn around and be blessing Israel. How can I say that? Look with me real quick in Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23, that's Bar in my Hebrew. Numbers chapter 23, we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. I won't give you the whole of the history behind it, but Balak is king. He's hired Balaam. Balaam has been hired to curse Israel. Takes him up on a hill to get him to, to look over Israel and curse it. Tries the second time when it fails the first time. Ba, uh, Balaam had gone along to do the cursing to get the reward, the financial reward. He's 100% into it, and yet he had warned, I won't be able to say anything God doesn't let me say. And God didn't let him curse Israel. So verses 11 and 12 says, And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, meaning Israel. But behold, you've actually blessed them. And he replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Even this prophet of evil, wanting to curse Israel, said, I can only say what God allows my mouth to say. And we see... But when you said that about the mouth, then why did God allow? I lost, lost track. Uh, lost track. Did God allow the other to happen? Um, I got up. I got. They went out the door. To allow Isaac to give the blessing because it was on the right son. If that had been Esau standing there, when the the blessing, the the right blessing would, was going out, I believe God would have stopped it. So one way or another, cause Isaac not to be able to speak. Cause, uh, the, the wrath of God could have fallen and Esau could have lost his Does life. Isaac realize it later? Or he At this point in this verse where he stopped that pause and yes, oh, I get it, yeah. God said it. And he will be blessed. Yes, I believe Isaac came to his senses at that point. He realized that he was stepping in it. He was doing wrong. God had overruled. 
and I think he probably fell on his face before God and I hope even thanked God for not allowing him to make such a major mistake which we know God wouldn't have let him make because God wouldn't let the line be contaminated wouldn't let it be ruined um, the high priest spoke prophetically about the meaning of Yeshua Jesus' death. He didn't even understand it, but he too spoke prophecy, spoke positive about Israel in that way that uh, was beyond his mind because he's not a saved person. It wasn't, you know, his, who he was and what he would say. But he said, and this is Yochanan John 11, verses 49 to 52. But one of them, one of the high priests, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it's expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. What a mouthful he said. He was not a believer in Yeshua. He's one of the ones wanting Yeshua to be, uh, to be cursed, to be put to death because He's an infiltrator, and he's a blasphemer, and he's taking people the wrong way. And so Caiaphas is one of the ones that's going to try Jesus and not agree with what's being done as being right. But what he said there, it's expedient for one man to die. Why? For the people, not for himself. He's going to die for the people so that a whole nation not perish. How will Israel be saved? She'll put her faith in the one who does give his life for Israel. Verse 51, now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So it would go beyond Israel, beyond the borders of her nation to the world. He said it. He said the whole thing, and yet he was unsaved, not with a right heart before God. Balaam wants to curse the people. It turns into a blessing. Now we come back to Yitzhak, to Isaac, and even though Isaac is a believer in the God of Israel, he still was about to make a major mistake, and God didn't let him. So the blessing went to the son that it was supposed to go to. God's plan is not thwarted. Now I got it. If that uh, a prophet that was trying to curse Israel and God put the words in, well then why did God stop him when He told him send the women in there? Why didn't God stop that? I mean He did everything else by now. He the words that He told him how to get the people to was not a prophetic utterance, and prophecy will never lie. So He could advise how to make the, the people fall. The same way that right now, the, well, let's take it to the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to have a false prophet who's going to help him, who he's going to have power from Satan, who's going to put thoughts and ideas in his mind. This is how you do it. This is how you carry it out. God doesn't stop man from doing their evil plans when it doesn't thwart God's perfect plan. He allows it to bring about the final end that will justify and make right what is wrong today and will bring us into a better place. God could have stopped Adam and Eve from what they did in the garden, but he allowed them that free choice. And the one who got that advice could have said, if God won't let you curse them, I'm not going to even take that step. I better back off and I better not get on God's bad side. But he chose to go ahead and set the trap and Israel chose to not be obedient to her God and fall into that trap. So God can stop anything. He allows what we don't understand, but he only allows what does not, um, does not, uh, boy, I need a good vocabulary today, does not, um, does not touch his perfect plan. I'll just put it that way. That perfect plan just will never be stopped. You know, they tried to king Jesus. They weren't able to. They tried to, to kill him in other ways, throw him off a cliff. They weren't able to. Satan tried to get him to fall at his feet when he was his weakest, humanly speaking. It didn't work. 
God allowed the death on the cross that was what was prophetically foretold. If the Jewish people had put him to death, he would have been stoned to death. That's not the right picture. That's not how a lamb is sacrificed. That's not what the picture was all through time. So God even didn't allow it to be through Jewish hands. It was through the hands of the Romans at the time when crucifixion is the, the means of, of, uh, of uh, capital punishment. So much. Do we understand all? No. No, absolutely not. Why does God stop this and allow that? Why did he allow the horrors that we're hearing about today? Because God is allowing sin to run its path in this world. God is allowing man's free choice to, to continue to a certain point. But God does say there's a cup of wrath that's being filled up. And that's God's wrath. He is becoming more and more angry by what is going on, by the evils of man, uh, totally against his will. And he does say, a day is coming when I will say, enough is enough. The cup is full, and I will pour out my wrath on this earth, and it will suffer the consequences, and then I will bring my people through there will be victory, and we'll go on into a far better place. God does not stop man's free will. God does not stop the effect of sin in this world. That will come in the world to come, when the sin will be no more, and we never have to worry. It doesn't start all over again. It doesn't get repeated. Sin never enters in. A lie never enters in. Sin in no form enters in. But God allows, because he did not choose to make a robotic world. He chose to make the free will of man. Yeah. It's a very good question, though, and it's very hard, and people don't understand, and they'll say, how did God allow my child to be murdered? How did God allow these horrors to happen? You know, the one thing I, I will say for these, these little ones is, yes, exactly, they're in heaven. They are in glory. They are not suffering anything from this world, and they never will. And I hope, and I just have to let it go, but that it was quick, and then they were. And even, even during it, that there was the presence of the Lord with them in a way we don't know because we haven't experienced well, it. That gone through. woman, uh, she was talking to her father in America. She is a professor, and she was shielding her son. <laughs> which was beautiful, but they killed her, but the thing is, the boy did get spared. He did and just pray him. for him, for his mind, for all he's lived through. So, it, it is, we can't understand, I never will understand, how a human can treat another human in, in the ways that, that we're learning, and why God's grace is so long and merciful. Yeah, in, in waiting, why, why he doesn't say enough, it's enough today. It's because he's God and I'm Rochelle. Yeah. Because I, that's been out of my mouth, you know, is, isn't this enough, Lord? Isn't it time? Let's just get the plan on. Let's just go home and get the plan on. And then I think that, you know, for everyone that's getting saved today around the world, that's why it didn't happen yet. Because that number isn't full either. When that number is complete, that last one to make up what's called the body of Christ accepts the Lord. I don't know if it will be literally instantaneous, that there will be an amen on his or her lips and will be gone. But I guarantee you, if it's not that fast, it's going to be very, very quickly on the heels of that body being completed. Then God's going to say, okay, take my believers out because I don't pour my wrath on my believers. It's another proof for the pre-tribulation view uh, because the whole thing is the wrath of God. The tribulation period, why it's so much greater worldwide, all of that is because it's not just the motivations of man that we see how evil it is, but on top of that we see God pouring out his wrath. His saying, this is, this is it, this deserves this justice and his pouring it out. His timing is perfect. I'm anxious. He's not. Any of us and all of us who have any unsaved in our lives can say 
Thank you, Lord, for your grace that it's not over this moment because hopefully that one will get saved and escape the coming Holocaust. I understand your God's plan, even though it's horrifying, yet it's a free will in a way. And right, right. And without that free will, that's everything. That's everything. God didn't want people having. There's people, older people on their knees just praying mm -hmm. before they die. Mm -hmm. No, and even when they didn't have a chance to be on their knees praying, God knows that heart and knows those last moments. And if you've ever been in a car accident, you know how time stretches in the midst of something, you know, in those last moments, who knows what all the dealings of the Lord was with so many during that time. We, we don't know and we won't know. But I know that often we can look at things and think that's nothing but horror. I'm reminded of the little story, and I don't even know if this is supposed to be true or not, but a man that was on a deserted island, you know, he had, he had made it from the, the shipwreck, but here he's on an island, and he took all the wood that he could find, and he had made a big, you know, smoke signal, and, and it was dwindling, and there was no rescue, and uh, um, suddenly, I don't remember how, but suddenly his hut caught on fire, too. And he was just devastated because everything, the little bit he had, the little bit of protection, the little bit, you know, of, of food, whatever he had, everything just was burned. And he cried out in his agony to, to his God, how could you allow that to happen? It wasn't enough that I survived, you know, the shipwreck. It wasn't enough that, you know, all this work, I've tried to do everything right, and the whole thing just burned in my head, everything's gone. And that... I don't know, you know, hours later, here comes a ship on the horizon that rescued him. And when he asked them, how did you find me? The answer was, we saw a sudden smoke signal that went up. <coughs> Probably when his hut was on fire, that last whoosh. <laughs> so here he's crying, now, how did you, you know, how can you do that to me, God? And God's saying, I'm rescuing you. <laughs> you know, like I said, I don't know if it's supposed to be true or not, but it gives us the idea, and we all know. And he didn't need his hat if he was going to rescue you. Right, he didn't, he didn't even need it. You're right, you're right. But uh, I just know we've got to be quick to say, even when I do not understand. There's a great um, song that's out that was written by someone who was going through very, very deep waters. It was brought to my life and others in my life with me at a time when we were going through very deep waters. We got in touch with the one who sang it, not the one who wrote it. But I said to the one who sang it, I can only imagine what this one went through for these words. And she said, I'm not free to tell you, but you're right on target. But the words were, when you can't see his hand, when you don't know his plan, trust his heart. Mm. Trust his heart. Mm. It's, yeah, it will penetrate deep if you're in the midst of a hurt, let me tell you. So um, back on, so that we do at least some <clears throat> of Genesis here. Um, let's see, we're, we're picking up about verse 34, I think. I think I've done 33. You know, we see that, that Isaac realizes he's been fooled and, that, and, and he's given that blessing. And at first, hit the anger and all, and then we see that moment of God's will. God's will. I can't even, Isaac must have been thinking, I can't even get myself in God's way. God's will is what's being done. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and a bitter cry. Now don't read that and think he's thinking, oh, I'm so sorry, because that's not, he's crying out. I want to be blessed. Where's my blessing? He's, he, that's the way that he's crying out. He his is flesh. His flesh. He's crying out for that political status, that, that military status, that land pushing status. He wants all those blessings. He's not crying that we never see any repentance toward the Lord. We never see anything spiritual said toward the Lord. And all he can think of is, can't you pull it back, Dad? Can't you undo what you've done and give me my blessing? And remember, it's not even his. 
by virtue of his own actions, let alone by what God had spoken, and you know, before he was even born. But that's what he's crying out. He's crying out, you know, um, and that's why he says to his father, bless me, me as well, my father, do something, do something to write this, give me a blessing. You know, he's demanding out of his father for his own personal contentment, happiness, however you want to put it. And, it, and he said, no, okay, verse 35, and he said, uh, this is uh, Isaac speaking, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Or he came subtly, you may have, he came with cunning, he made with deception. Now Isaac's hardly knowing how to explain the truth to Esau. And at this point, he's not accepting any blame himself either. He's saying, it's your brother's fault, your brother deceived. He's robbed you of your blessing. So you see the, the, you know, the same way that, that Adam said, it's the it's the woman you gave me, God. It's her <laughs> fault. You know, Isaac's doing the same thing that just comes to all this naturally. They don't well, take their own blame. we don't want to take our own blame. And Isaac wasn't, even though he's realizing what he should have said to his son right then and there is, you and I both need to get right before the Lord. This is not the Lord's will. We were trying to do wrong. We need to bow to the will of the Lord. That's what he should have said. And I think that that Isaac probably. I would hope it did come around, but actually we're not going to hear much more about Isaac. Once he sends his son out with the blessing the right way, then he fades off the scene. So even though he's a great spiritual character to picture the Lord to us in the beginning, the ending isn't as quite as happy. The very last is okay, but, but very close to the end it's not. And what's being meant, meant here is very, very important to get across because I hear it taught in such a way that it opens the door to anti-Semitism. And at a time like today, if you don't think I am sensitive toward the fact that there's a world that hates the Jew and that there is festering throughout the world that feeling, if you think that you here in America, there's not Jew hatred here, did you see the protests in <clears throat> LA? Did you see those who are siding with the Palestinian and they, what their meaning is they're siding with Hamas? And they're calling out Israel and saying Israel is wrong. Where's their words for the babies? Where's their words for the elderly? Where's their words for those people who were literally in their own homes, minding their own lives? How can they justify all of that? And then when Israel defended herself and there's a, a death of an innocent on that side, they're all over screaming bloody murder that Israel is the murderers. Israel is the, the, the bad. I don't understand how it can be so twisted, but it, when Satan's behind it, yeah, I do understand, and that's really where it comes from. So they pull this out, and they say on the basis, especially what Esau says in verse 36, that this is the Jewish character. And yes, I've heard it personally, okay? It's not hearsay, I know it to be true. That Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has betrayed me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he's taken away my blessing. Okay, I'm going to stop there before I finish it. And again, you may have the words, he's overtaken, he's overreached, he's supplanted. Whatever you have, the Hebrew literally says, he's taken me by the heel twice now. Remember when they were being born, and that's how... Jacob got named heel catcher because he was grabbing the heel by his hand and the idea that it's come to take is that he wanted to flip his brother over now really you want to tell me that a baby being born through the canal of its mother is thinking I want to flip my brother over and I want to get in that first place and I want that baby doesn't even know what it means to be first at this stage <laughs> did they fight in the womb yes you're in my room get out of my room no you're in my womb get out of my womb <laughs> but really to to say that but this is what Esau is saying is he's trying to say well that's his name his name is this one who wants to flip over this one who wants to deceive this one who wants to take what isn't his but what I didn't understand is how did Jake get his hand out First, and then he got pulled, pulled back. back. <laughs> Only God knows. Only God knows. <laughs> Only God knows. Did you know that I got a, a, a text, I don't know who, 
and it was it was evil. It said the Jews deserve it. I go, no way. Sadly, you're not the only one who received that. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's a lot that went out like that. Mm. Yeah, and and that just shows you the the mind that can be so hateful. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that to me is even beyond deceived. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so, and when he says, taking away my blessing, that blessing went with a birthright, okay? It, there is a, a, a lesser blessing that goes to the other children, but the blessing that goes with the birthright, that's, that's like part A and part B. That's like heads and tails of one coin. That goes together. This isn't a second sneaky trick. The blessing does get said later. They know the birthright belongs to normally the oldest child. And the blessing comes when the father thinks that he's dying. So obviously it can be years in between the two. But it's a one complete package. It's not something that can be separated. One cannot give the birthright to the eldest son and the blessing that goes with it to a younger son. Now God said both birthright and blessing are to go to the younger son. So both had to go to uh, Jacob, not to Esau. And for Esau to say he's deceived or he's overtaken, Esau, you willingly sold it, let alone what God said. So God said it in the spiritual. You acted it out in the physical. Now when it's coming down to the consequences of your own action, you're still trying. Who's trying to deceive? Esau is trying to deceive his father. This is mine. If he were being honest and truthful, he should have said, this belongs to my brother. I made a bad decision on a bad day, but I have to live with what I said and I did. But he, there's none of this. He just, with his anger and his frustration over not getting what he wanted, he is turning very, very bitter. And we're going to see that. But he goes on and he says, bless me as well, my father. He's probably hoping in some way Isaac's going to say, I will re relent. I will pull it back from Jacob. I will give it to you. I'll turn it around. I'll make it right. He's probably thinking there's some way that his dad's going to justify this, you know, make it right for him. But that's not what happens, and it's not what Isaac could have done. I mean, if God didn't let him give it to him in the first place, it's not going to happen in the second place. So he says, have you not reserved, I'm sorry, a blessing for me? There's got to be something for me. Okay, so we go into verse 37. But Yitzhak, Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master. I've given to him all his relatives as servants. And with grain and new wine, I've sustained him. And, and that sustain, I've girded him up. I've given him all of the blessings. What then can I do for you, my son? Notice he still calls him his son. He's not disowned. It wasn't that he's going to have nothing. It's just he's not going to be in that superior position and receive all these physical blessings that, that he was wanting. So how does Esau take that when Isaac says, what can I do for you? Esau says to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me as well, my father. And then he raised his voice and he wept. It's like he's trying to show how unhappy he is and he's crying these tears. But his tears are tears for his selfishness. They're frustrated selfishness. There again is no regret, no mention of sin, no mention of I despised my birthright and now I'm reaping what I sowed, nothing like that. And one of my sources that I read even said, and you can take it if you want, he says, here's Esau screaming like a woman and weeping like a baby. This he-man is being shown for the character that he really is. Now, that was somebody's view, and I just chuckled, so I, I pass it on. Where, uh, where he's come from, because back in those days, Roger, that is something very, very uh, special. That was something very special. It's more than just special. It, it, re it comes along with it um, responsibilities. It comes along with it. Um, it's, there's so much. They're not blessed just so that this is the favored right. child. No. That elder son is going to take care of the wife, the mother, the unmarried daughters, the household servants. 
He's going to be taking care of everything. All the responsibility falls on his shoulders. If he makes mistakes, the whole household is going to pay for it. So God blesses him with a, a good start, so to speak, with what he needs to be able to meet out the needs of the others. Not for him to, oh, this is all mine. Mm -mm -mm. Let me eat and be fat. No, let me delve out. My sister doesn't have a husband and family taking care of her. Let me set her up and give her these crops and give her this portion of land and let her live here in a life that is comfortable for her, where she doesn't fear, where's my roof and who's going to protect me. There was so much that went with it besides the fact of being the spiritual head of the whole clan. And that's the key thing. Esau had no heart spiritually how could he be the head of the spiritual family the well-being of the family spiritually pass that down to his children who are going to pass it down to keep going down to the line of the messiah there was absolutely no way and i believe that's what god before they were ever born he said before they ever did anything i chose but i believe that he chose knowing the spiritual versus the flesh Otherwise, you could say that God is eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I like you and I don't like you. I don't think that was what God's heart was. But it says that he chose us first. He draws us, then we come to him. But no one can stand before God and say, you didn't give me a chance. It's your fault, God. I'm perishing because you didn't let me. No, no one can say that. And Esau has to say, this was my choice. Even though God ordained and God overall rules, he rules with a perfect knowledge. He rules with a perfect love. He rules with a perfect care. And there was a blessing for Esau. Out of him comes children. Out of him comes nations. That line could be blessed if that line would be right with God, but they bring on to themselves the same way Cain and his following brought on to themselves the anger of God and the judgment of God. And God just saw to it that this line, what Isaac is to pass down, had to be passed to someone who had a heart for God. And Esau was not there. He didn't have a heart for God. And God knew. He knew that before the child was even born. He knew. But Isaac does have a blessing for him too. And, and so um, his father Isaac, verse 39, answers and says to Esau, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. And by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But it shall come about when you become restless, that you will break his yoke from your neck. So what does this mean? First of all, Esau's blessing, there's not the mention of God's name in it. Esau finally does get what he was really interested in, a physical blessing. That's all he's going to get, a material blessing. Um, but it is also a prophecy about his descendants, and we even see that in the book of Hebrews. Uh, go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 20. Hebrews 11 and verse 20. Whoops. I have Hebrews the 12th chapter. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, I've got too many fingers in my tablet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right now we want Hebrews 11 and, and verse 20. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. And it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. When Isaac gave his blessing, he did give it on both his sons, and it was for their sons' sons. It was to go on down. So both were blessed, and notice they were blessed by faith. We'll come back to that also. Okay, but in this blessing that Esau receives, there's not the mention of God. Okay, go down to verse 28 in Genesis, or I guess we're going up. Yeah, go up to verse 28. Um, when in, in chapter 27 of Genesis, when Jacob is being blessed, Isaac thinks it's Esau, but he's really blessing Jacob. Notice in verse 28, may God give you the dew of heaven 
and the fatness of the earth. Now to Esau, it just simply says, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, away from the dew of heaven from above. So he's been given material blessings, but not with that greatness of God's hand in the material blessings. It's not necessarily going to come from the hand of God, but you'll get blessings from the land. You'll reap some of what you sow in the land, in other words. Um, look real quick at chapter 36, Genesis 36, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Okay, <clears throat> now, we're going to have, following that, the descendants of Esau, but here it just tells us in verse 6 of chapter 36, that Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all his household, his livestock and his cattle, and all his property which he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. Notice he had blessings. He had wife, wives, he had daughters, he had, um, what I just read, cattle, property, but he's having to leave, he's having to move away to another land away from his brother. For their possessions had become too great for them to live together, and the land where they resided could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. Edom is Esau's descendants, in other words. So um, it, you, I'm giving you the sneak peek to the future. Esau does receive blessing. He is blessed in family, etc. But he is, uh, as this said, he had to go away from the land. Jacob, I mean, I'm sorry, Isaac had foretold that in, uh, I got to go back, in chapter 27. And what we were reading right here, away from the land, I think is how it said it. I'm trying to get back there where verse, um, yeah, verse 39. Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. Away from the dew of heaven from above. He's going to have to move. He's going to have to move out. The land of Canaan, the promised land, will stay in Jacob's family. Now, if we carry that down to this very day, argue with God, okay? God said it. The land was to go down through Isaac's line, which is going to go down through Jacob's line now, and goes on. We know out of Jacob come the 12 tribes of Israel, and the name Israel that's associated with the land of this day. Esau's descendants are Edom. Edom has a country area outside of that land. Edom and, and um, Moab. Moab are on the right side of the map when you're looking at the Bible map of Israel. But God's making it very clear in verse in chapter 36, and we'll hit that again when we get there. Their land is outside of what's Israel. The promised land belongs to the line of the Jew that comes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It does not belong to Esau, and it does not belong to Ishmael. When Isaac and Ishmael had that split there also. This is how God ordained it. He did not say that Edom would have no blessing. He didn't say that Ishmael would have no blessing. He said ten nations would come out of Ishmael, and they did. And he showed what will happen with Edom. Edom's going to go up and down because Edom's going to bring cursing from God on themselves time and again. And that's the part about the yoke being broken off. I'll read that for you. Maybe I am ready to read that now. I'll give you one line in between, and that's, Your brother you shall serve. Okay, Edom is Esau. He's going to have to bow under his brother as head. Read with me now in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 8. And we will see that what was prophesied, it uh, does come true. 2 Samuel chapter 8. In 2 Samuel 8, verse 14 says, He put garrisons in Edom. In all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became servants to David, and the Lord helped David wherever he went. So did the brother serve the brother? Yes. Edom, the descendants, had to come under the authority of David. David is in the line coming down from Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it goes down to David. So when Edom came under subjection of Israel in David's day, which is is hundreds of years later. Um, I'm trying to think of the timing we're in right now, but it's, it's a long ways away. Um, now let me just say hundreds so I can move on. 
it was fulfilled even at that time and at that point. And when it says that, that Esau would become restless and that he would break this yoke, the Hebrew says he would strive. He'll shake himself. He's not going to take it and be, okay, I, I just have to accept this. He's going to fight the whole time. It's going to bother him the whole time. Remember when Cain killed Abel and he was sent out. That would be put a mark on him so he wouldn't be hunted down. But it was said that he would never, he'd be restless this whole time. Here we see it again. Sin brings restlessness. Not Bowing to God, who is the authority, brings restlessness. It brings striving. It does not bring contentment. But he did say that, that there would be a breaking of that bondage that they were under. Look with me in Second Chronicles. We'll see what happens there. The Chronicles of the Kings, you know, Second Chronicles chapter 21. And we read there in verse 8, In his days Edom, same people, revolted against the rule of Judah. And they set up a king for themselves, okay? We're going to have our own king. And that's what they did. They broke the bondage. They broke away. They, they set up their own, quote, kingdom. Verse 10 of Second Chronicles 21, right there. Same chapter, verse 10. So Edom revolted against Judah to this day, to the day that this was recorded. And then it goes on from there. So, yes, Edom did exactly what God said. They'd be servants, they'd break that yoke. They'll be servants, they'll break that yoke. And the Edomites really had remained independent until David's time. Then they were subjugated, and permanently after that, in a sense, we'll see frequent rebellions, but we never see freedom forever for the Edomites. They're always being brought under subjection to the house of Jacob, because that is what God said would happen. But um, it, it's even even in the prophecy and uh, Isaac trying to bless his son, the truth is still coming out. You'll have blessing. You'll have a lesser blessing. You're also going to have trouble. You're going, you know, it's not going to um, just, oops, I'm in, yeah, I'm in the right chapter, sorry. It's not going to be the way that you want it to be. It's going to be the way that God ordained it and God said that it would be. So, how does Esau take all this? Verse 41. So Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. So what's Esau holding against Jacob? You got my blessing. Notice no change in attitude. No change in heart. No desire to follow God's will and God's way now. No desire to get right before God. We don't read any of that, sadly. And the Hebrew says he cherished his enmity. He, he cherished his grudge. I call it like when you've got a pet peeve against someone and everything that they do, you let feed that pet peeve. You take out that little pet, you pet that pet, and you help that pet grow, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it just absorbs you more and more. That's what he saw us doing, okay? He, he had this grudge, and, and he kind of made almost to pride in his grudge because, you know, this, this, he's just so against his brother Jacob because his brother Jacob got that blessing. And so Esau even says to himself, I forgot to bring something out. Before he says that, let me bring this out because of what's happening today. Isaac was hated right here. Okay, we, well, we read in chapter 26. Um, remember when Isaac was around the wells and he had to keep moving because he, it was contentious and there was strife with the others. They didn't like him. They didn't want him. And he had to keep moving to find a place that he could live in contentment. Okay? Isaac was hated. Now, Jacob is hated. We read it right here. He's, he's hated by his brother, and I'm going to say it the way that we see it prophetically. He's hated by his brother Edom. Not just Jacob and Esau, but this is going to continue on in Esau's um, descendants. They're going to hate their brother Jacob. We see that literally down to today. The Arab world that is the world that hates Israel, hates Jacob, represents the Edom, the Edomites. Not that they are Edomites, but they're the descending line that comes with that hatred. 
And really, uh, what I'm showing you is that this hatred has been there through the years. It's been there through the centuries. It was there in Isaac's day. It was there in Jacob's day. It is there in our day. And when those rise up and say, but my people have been in that land 50 years. That's our land. Israel made us get out of our own homes. You have to take it all the way back. It's a land that God said would go to the Jewish line, not to the Arab line. God promised blessing to the Arabs apart from, but not within that area. So when they try to claim right, God gave that right to the Jewish side of the family. I'll put it that way. But the hatred will be there until the Prince of Peace comes on earth and his will is done. Then we even see that hatred rise up again one last time as Satan goes through the, the earth bringing together all of those who want to put Satan on the throne and remove God. And I, I just cannot even fathom that hatred. Yes, right now we see it toward the Jew, but really ultimately behind it is a hatred of God. It's the hatred of the one true and living God, the God who identifies himself as the God of Israel, the God who chose to put his name on this geographic location, and the God who chose to do that to bring blessing to the entire world. But there's an enemy of God. He is not God's equal. He is less than. He is a created being. God is eternal. God never started. God never ends. And God's never kicked off of his throne. But this evil one has the audacity, worse than Esau coming up in Jacob's face. He comes up in the face of our very God, the God that we worship and honor also as believers through Yeshua Jesus, and has the, the mindset that he can dethrone the God of Israel. He can do that right now if he wipes out Israel, then Yeshua Jesus has no one to come back to. There's no millennial kingdom. Those, there's no reigning on earth. When he loses that battle, he simply moves to the next phase and at the end of the <clears throat> millennium, tries once again to wipe God out, God's way, and put himself up on the throne. Now you want to know what a God he is? He's a God that's putting in the hearts of men to mutilate babies and to kill the person because they're a Jew or because they're a believer in Jesus. He is a God that lies to his people and says, go out and martyr them and you'll have 72 virgins in heaven. Never giving thought to what the, it is for those poor virgins. <laughs> but what a lie. Those who are losing their lives now in this battle against God and against God's people are waking up in eternal torment. They are not waking up in heaven. They are not waking up being blessed. And they have only themselves to blame because they made the choice. And that this is a hard lesson for every human being that we make our choices and then we live with the consequences. But they can turn to their God and they can say to their God, how dare you lie to me? How dare you tell me how wonderful it's going to be and look what I get and even if they did say it to Satan do you think for a moment he's going to say oh I'm so sorry no he's going to say well you got me one more you got me 50 more you got me a hundred more you I used you to to lie to the world you are my tool that's just tough beanies on you now flip that to our God and when we are in the presence of our God, we can literally fall on our faces and say, why am I here? I don't deserve this. And God will say, I love you. I loved you so much. I didn't demand your life out of you. I sent my son to die for you. This is the only way that I will say that they're equals is as great as God's love is. Satan's evil is that opposite. Not power, not strength, not might, don't get me wrong, but he hates with a hate that I cannot even comprehend. And the true, the one true and living God 
is the God who laughs, who bends over backwards that not one live in eternal torment. That's the God of Israel. That's the living God. That's the one that Esau is so opposed to that he wanted his will above God's will. And the consequences that come on him and his people who follow in his footsteps are brought on none other but by themselves. Esau had no one to blame but himself for wanting what was not to be his. And he never would have suffered a bad life if he had been in that second place. That wasn't what God was saying. He just wouldn't have had the spiritual responsibility because God knew his heart wasn't right for it. But the hatred of the Jew stems all the way as far back as there is a Jew. That before there's even, Isaac wasn't even called Jewish. But the hatred is there because it's direct enmity against God. And that's all that it is. Amazing. So now Esau's response, and I'll probably be tying up with it, but I, I do want to get through this, this bad part. <laughs> Esau held that grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Remember, even Isaac thought, I'm giving out my blessing now because I think I'm dying, but he's going to live about... <laughs> 43 more years, 43 to 45 more years. They were way off base, okay? But Esau thinks it's going to be very near at hand. And so he says, I will. He's going to do what he wants still. He's still full of himself. Then I will kill my brother. That murder of his brother would prevent his brother from having dominion over him. He's still fighting it. He's still fighting that he's lost. And what we really have is this total, well, I'm not going to say it's a total change in character, but he's showing his true character. The same way that Hamas tried to say that they're for freeing the Palestinians, but their actions have shown that they really are murderers at heart, that they do not have any, any um, uh, human life is not valued by them. They've lied and tried to say it and hid it under the guise of a people that they're saying they're fighting for. But if that were true, then they would have fought military. They would have fought a battle that where that is what's happening, but that's not what Israel is doing, and that's not who they went after. Esau, showing his true colors, is showing that he's, he's not even, I mean, we said he was the sportsman and the he-man, the man's man and all of that, but he's very bitter here. He's very vindictive, and he's really neurotic. I'm going to have to kill my brother now because that's the only way I'm going to have to be able to live. No, it isn't how Jacob would have treated him. It isn't what he would have had to have done. But believing it's, it's short, believing it's just a few days, Hebrew says some days, he is going to wait to kill his brother. Now, when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent word and she called her younger son Yaakov and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Wow. That's a heavy weight for the circumstances that have gone on now. Re Rebecca realizes he, he means it. They must have all thought Isaac was near death because she's not saying, it, it, you know, he's not going to die. Don't worry about it. It's an empty threat. She's scared. I don't want to lose you also, Jacob. And that's what she says in this next, next sentence. And we don't know which way to take it. I'll tell you the two ways. But she said, you know, that Esau is consoling himself, concerning by planning to kill you. Now then, my son, obey my voice. Remember, she told Jacob to obey me. You know, put on the Esau's garments, put on the hairy stuff, go into your father, do what I'm telling you to do. She's still calling shots here okay she's trying to to scramble and cover for what's going on now again this is where we need to turn to the lord even if when we've blown it even when we've made a mistake even when we're on the the wrong even if it's for the right reasons because remember we've looked at people who do things like lie to spare life in the holocaust and so forth still this is where we've got to turn to the lord and rebecca could have said lord my god protect my son jacob 
but she's so concerned that she's saying, Obey my voice, arise, flee to Haran, go to my brother Lavan. In other words, go to your uncle, okay? Stay with him a few days. Again, she thinks it's not going to be long until your brother's fury subsides. Why is she concerned about this? Because she says, until your brother's anger against you subsides, that he forgets what you did to him. <laughs> well, wasn't Jacob alone, was it? But still how she put it. She said, then I'll send word, I'll get you from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? Here's what we don't know. Did she mean, why should I lose my husband Isaac and my son Jacob in one day? I tend to think that's probably what was in her mind. But she is the mama of Esau. This is her son. She loved both her sons, and rightfully so. God did not tell her not to love Esau. He just simply said the order of who was to be head of the family because of the importance of the spiritual. But in, in uh, um, the laws that they had for the, the people of that day, so this is, this is pre-Moses, so I, I'm not... I'm not saying it's in the law, but we have in the Mosaic law it carried on. But the law of that day for them that they would live under would be that if a brother kills his brother, he comes under judgment for it. So she could have been thinking, I'll lose both of my sons. My sons are my heritage. You know, They are the future of the family. I'll lose both of my sons in that same day. So either way, either she's thinking I'll lose my husband and my son or I'll lose both of my sons. Either way, she had herself a problem. If you want to read about that law where the, the son that kills one kills the other, well, let's read it real fast just so you see why that could possibly be it. This is in 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 14, and it is um, verses 6 and 7. Okay, um, and Samuel, you know, is the one who appoints David king, so time has moved on, you know, from where we are now. But in verse, where am I starting? Verse 6, it says, Your maidservant had two sons. Okay, that would be like Rebecca had two sons. But the two of them struggled together in the field. There was no one to separate them, so one struck the other and killed him. Now behold, the whole family has risen against your maidservant. They've come against the mama of the, the two, the, the one dead son and the one live son, and they've said, hand over the one who struck his brother that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed and destroy the heir also. So in other words, the son that did the killing isn't to get off. He's to lose his life too and not become heir of everything because he killed off his brother. So that's where that law was being passed down. We can see it in effect here if that's what Rebecca was meaning. If she was afraid of losing two sons, then that law was in effect at this time. Look at Genesis 9, 6, and then we'll come right back to the chapter we're in. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Come on, tablet. Oh, were we slow. Okay. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. That's capital punishment. God ordained that when they came out of the ark and lived after the flood. Before that time, remember, Cain killed his brother, and God didn't say, now, Cain, your life is to be taken from you. He put a mark on Cain and said, no one can touch him. He's to live out his life naturally, but he sends him out as a vagabond. He doesn't just get away with it. But we see a change. We see from the time of the flood on that there is judgment. If you take life, life is to be taken from you. If we followed that through in a just and right way to this day, well, there would be less death out there because people might think twice about taking someone else's life if they knew they could pay the consequence with their own life. Just, um, just putting that out there. But back at 27, and I think, let me see where we are left in 27. Uh, I'll go back to it. Let's see where I can stop. Okay, now and then, come on. My tablet has just got a mind of its own today. Okay, let me just put the chapter back in. I've lost my chapter, so sorry, folks. I'm trying, I'm really trying to tie up because I know some of you need to go and I don't want to belong, you know, drag it out, but I want to finish the thought. Um, and of course, we'll recap later. 
yeah, I won't, I won't go on and explain verse 46. I'll just say, you know, she's already saying that she can't stand the thought of losing either husband and son or son and son in one day. Another reason why I think it's husband and son is she's also going to point out in the next verses that Esau is married to heathen women. Remember when the wife is left as a widow, it's the son who takes care of the widow. So if Jacob's out of the picture and she's left with Esau, she's left with his wives who influence the home, she can only imagine what her life is going to be like if they're in charge of seeing to her needs and taking care of her. You know, they didn't have a good relationship with Esau's wives. You got the mother-in-law problems here, but this time it's because of the daughter-in-laws, not the mother-in-law. <laughs> and I don't believe that God is saying mother-in-laws are bad. I'm saying we just see the, you know, forget it. I'm getting too wordy. I'll come back. I'll explain to you who the daughters of Heth are that Esau has for his wives. I'll show you what he thinks he can do to write that with his parents. We will show you next week that Isaac does send his son out with blessing the way he should have blessed him, knowing it was him. He will bless him in that right way. And then I, that thought question that I gave you for those who get my text ahead is going to have to, I'm going to give you a whole week to think about it. I've brought out to you very clearly, none of the four were acting in total, they're being godly, God-led, and their actions are godly. They're all scrambling with their own actions in here. But I've also shown you how, not that it makes it any more right, I don't mean that, but Rebecca and Jacob had the right motive, wanting the Lord's will to be done, where Isaac and Esau were out of the, that, that far out, they weren't even after the Lord's will to be done, they were after their own will to be done. When Jacob goes out, he's not going out, I'll say this much, he's not going out because of punishment. Like when Cain was sent out and became a vagabond. When Esau's going to have to move off the property because they can't get along. This is not why Jacob goes out. In fact, there's a very right reason in his going out. But notice, before you judge Jacob, before you say, well, he's a deceiver and he just got what he deserved. Notice how God treats Jacob in our next chapter. Take a sneak peek. Because it is something really amazing. And that says to me, hmm, before we judge, maybe we better think through how God has responded. And I will encourage you, take that, take it through all the Bible people and take it into lives today. We are very quick to judge people. We are very quick to say, oh, how could they do that? Another example, Elijah. You've just taken off a prophet's of Baal, and now you're running from a woman. And I hear that all the time, and they say, how could this great man of God blow it in the next chapter? Well, if you've ever studied Elijah, and you find out the exhausted level he was at, and you realize he just couldn't go on any further, and what does God do? Feed him, sleep him, take care of him, and then, <clears throat> what you doing here, Elijah? And when he sends them back into the fight, sends them back in with a partner to be in it with him. That doesn't sound like a God who condemned Elijah. And I'm just going to say, I've already tipped my hand, but I don't see a God who condemns Jacob in the next chapter. And I don't see Jacob being sent out in judgment. What do I see? Come back and see, and I'll keep, I'll keep giving you proof for why I see what I see. Because, like I say, there's something really amazing coming. And I'll bring you into the Hebrew background of it to help, you know, bring you the fuller picture. So I'll just warn you, we're not going to fly through the next chapter. Anybody who wants that bird's eye view, find another class, folks. I'm going to take us. I'm gonna, we're going to dive deep. But I think you're going to love what we're going to find. Because uh, it's a beautiful... Okay, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. It's late. Thank you for staying with me through this. Um, so much we can learn from it. And what a parallel to our times today. I don't think it's accidental we were on this chapter with what's going on in our world conditions. I thank each and every one of you for your love for Israel. 
I do not stand here to condemn the Arab population. I love and pray for the Arabs to be saved, the same as I do for my Jewish brethren. I have Arab friends. We have pictures of us in Israel with our arms around Arab believers. There's a unity in the Lord that makes us one family, and it's beautiful. And that family is made up of everything, not just one. And that's what God's wanted all along. So please understand, yes, I stand with Israel loud and clear in this. This war was thrust on them. This was not anything that Israel started or wanted. She must defend her people to be able to live in the land God has promised them. So I am very pro-Israel. I do stand with Israel, but my heart hurts for the innocent, as they call themselves, even though it's a misnomer, Palestinian, who really does want to live in peace. I will call them the Israeli Arabs and you know the others, but there are those who do. And God bring the day when this world will live in that kind of peace. Questions, comments before we close in prayer? Okay, we'll close in prayer and then I'll let you have your say because you've heard mine. And What can I do in closing prayer, Lord, but pray again for the peace of Jerusalem. We're praying for a peace that we mean far beyond just that city that you've chosen to put your name on and the Temple Mount that we'll see it filled with the presence of your glory. Oh, how we long for that day. But we do pray for peace throughout that land. We pray for the innocent who want to live side by side in peace that they be allowed to. We pray for those who do not care about life and are murdering even at this moment. Lord, stop them. Stop them. Don't allow their weapons to work. Don't allow them to carry out their plans. Put confusion in their camps. Arise and may their enemies scatter, even as scripture says that when God arises, the enemies scatter. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you will have your final say, that your plan is not being thwarted, it's not being stopped, it's not even on pause. You are in control in a way we do not understand. But Lord, we stand here being your servants, bowing down and thanking you for what we don't deserve. And that's all the grace and the mercy, the love and our own very own salvation. Lord, thank you. You have blessed us so. May we in the midst of this hatred, this, this world that hates, may we show the love of God. May we be lights for you, testimonies for you. May we live it. May we not take our problems into our own hands and make a mess of things, but may we turn to you and allow you to work. May we stand still and see the salvation of our Lord when there is a crisis. May we not panic and take things into our own hands. Lord, may we show something different to how we handle even our hardships and our trials that will draw an unsafe person to you. And we do pray, Lord. We just plead for souls saved. In this horror that's going on right now, Lord, may more souls be saved than those are lost. And we pray your blessing on each and everyone who is trying to serve you and follow you. Lord, give them the strength. Give them the grace. Give them the wisdom. That again, Lord, our hearts just ache to see you come back and rule and reign and to move on into an eternity that leaves sin, death, war, all of this behind forever and ever. Hallelujah for the blessing of that sure future that you have for those who come to believe in you. We praise you forever and ever and long to do it in bodily person, Lord, <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Keep listening. If we're here next week, then we'll have class. But we might have a greater class around his throne. <laughs> you think that's part of the rapture that we're going through now? Do I think what? Is this part of the rapture? I don't think... The rapture is instantaneous. Okay. The rapture is instantaneous. The rapture is being caught up. I that's know. an instantaneous we're act. Going through any, we're just going through the troubled times right now. We are going through the shadow of the tribulation. We're not in the tribulation. The tribulation is totally different than what's going on right now. But as we get closer to that time, the evilness that will be on the face of the earth during that time is casting its shadow on us. And like Dr. McGee, who's been in heaven now, I think I heard today, 35 years. Amazing. He was one of my mom's Bible teachers. And I love to hear him and think how he brought 
he brought Genesis alive. He brought the characters alive to her, and I hope I'm doing that for you. Not that I'm on that level, but um, like he said, when you drive into the mountain, the shadow falls on you long before you get into the mountain. We're in that shadow, the mountain being the tribulation. But I fully believe, and I will back it up for any who want, I have teachings on it. I fully believe the Lord takes us out before that tribulation oh, yeah. period comes on this earth. So we're not in it. This is a tribulation. It is not the tribulation. The tribulation is worldwide, and it follows the book of Revelation very clearly. But many, many, many scriptures, and I can answer the scriptures that they use to oppose my view. I'll give you why I disagree with them. To show and to say and to stand here securely, look up, our redemption draws nigh. I cannot give you a date. I would not give All you a date. The, the Lord says you don't do that. And as soon as I would give you a date, I can guarantee you that's when he will not come. <laughs> so I won't give you a date. But I will give you the hope and encouragement. It could be even this day. And uh, I can see it easily the, right after us being taken out with what's going on in that it, around Israel, one stepping up on the scene and saying, I know how to bring it all together. Let's make nice. And there's your false peace. That's a peace treaty that takes place with Israel. That doesn't mean that the first three and a half years there's peace on the face of the earth. That's what's such a misnomer that people say, oh, the first part isn't bad. The first part has war. It has famine. It has pestilence. It has things happening that are bad. But then when, when God adds, adds on top of that, then it gets even worse to the point that there wouldn't even be a life left if God didn't come back and stop that battle. But it's not a peace for the world. It looks like a peace for Israel with her enemies for a very short time. And even in that, there's still going to be tragedy, mayhem, and horrors. So much more I could say. But I'm trying to let it be your time to talk, ask questions, make comments. Because uh, I go on and on and on. But if you need my teachings on that, if you're insecure, if you're shaky, I'll be glad to shore you up. Not by Rochelle's words. But as I always say, what does the Word of God say? And where the Word of God says, stake your life on it, folks, because you won't be let down. God said it. I believe it. Amen. That settles it. Amen. Exactly. Lord bless exactly. You. Lord bless you both, too.